She encourages people all over the world, but until now, few people knew about the challenges that Johnny Erickson Tata and her husband Ken faced in their marriage. They talk about their untold love story next. Hello and welcome to Significant Insights. Today we have a rare treat for you because Johnny Erickson Tata is our guest. Johnny always blesses us with her attitude and insights and today her husband Ken joins us as well. As most of you know, Johnny is celebrated around the world as an inspirational speaker, an author, singer, painter, and host of radio and television programs, all done from her wheelchair during her 45 years as a quadriplegic. Well today, Johnny and Ken take us behind the scenes of their 30 years of marriage, which they write about in Johnny and Ken, an untold love story. Their marriage is especially unique given Johnny's severe disability, her great celebrity, and many of the health challenges that she's encountered along the way. We started by talking about one of her most difficult problems of late, which is severe and chronic pain. Johnny has suffered with pain daily for the last 15 years. Medication didn't work, and she's had bad side effects, so she manages the pain with stretches, fluids, prayer, and an eternal perspective on suffering. What I did not know some years ago, that there will be a better day, that it will not always be this bad, that there will be a little bit of reprieve, and uh, those, those hopeful outlooks on my own future um, make it possible to deal with the day as it is. Beside, Jerry, it is my pain that drives me to Jesus. When I wake up in the morning, I wake up needing Jesus desperately. I really require him urgently. Um, maybe some people hit the alarm, throw back their covers, jump out of bed, scarf down breakfast, rush out the front door. I can't, I don't. I, I, I can't live on automatic pilot. I need Jesus every single moment and that that's a good place to be. That's not a bad that's not a bad way to wake up in the morning needing Christ that much. Johnny, we, we like to think as Christians, especially evangelical Christians, that uh, we don't have to put up with pain. That that uh, have you ever had Christians to say to you, uh, you really shouldn't be having this? Oh yes, I have. I um, I remember I spoke at a conference once. It was uh, a conference where there were a lot of um, women who. Um, who were Pentecostal and they, they um, came up to me and insisted that, that there was some unconfessed sin in my life and they wanted to pray for my physical healing. And uh, I remember telling them, I said, well, since you've asked to, to pray about my healing, may I, may I ask you to pray about these things specifically? And then I went on to say, please pray that God will remove from me my sour disposition when my pain gets bad. Please pray for my rotten attitude when things don't go my way. Please pray that, um, that I'll quit, have this itchiness to always get things my way, that I'll quit manipulating my husband with those precisely timed phrases, that I will, that I will quit fudging the truth, that I, you know, all these things that I want to be healed from. Because Jesus, I mean, the same man who healed blind eyes and withered hands also said, gouge out that eye if it causes you to sin. Cut off that hand if it leads you into hell. So I think that shows his priorities. Sure, he was using a metaphor, but it shows God's priorities. And his priorities are um, the soul. He's concerned about our souls, the health of our soul. So you believe that there is a purpose for your affliction? I, I do. I think most of us as Christians don't like suffering, of course. Um, it's it's uh, Jesus spent most of his time on earth trying to relieve it. I think that God shows God's heart and attitude about it. but. That does not mean uh, his only relationship to it is to remove it. Um, I know we Christians, we, we try very hard to do that. We want to medicate it, drug it, uh, surgically exorcise it, institutionalize it, divorce it, do everything but live with it. But we're told in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, to this we've been called. <clears throat> Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And if my Savior learned obedience through the things that he suffered, am I above my master? I don't think so. And, and so um, I count suffering as that Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 perspective. You know, you, it's been granted to you. It's been given to you. 
you know, it's a gift, this thing, to suffer on his behalf. And no, I'm not being persecuted. I'm not living in a foreign country where there's persecution, not that kind of suffering, but suffering in the sense that I've got a hold on to my smile. Too much is at stake. The cosmic stakes are too high. God's reputation in me is on display. And so I want to make certain I honor him and, and tell the world and show the world that his grace is sufficient. Ken, what, what is it like being married to a person <laughs> with this kind of chronic pain? Obviously, when the two of you married, uh, to some degree, you knew what you were accepting. Is it more than what you expected? Well, you know, Jerry, I, I, I think the pain came later. We've been married 30 years, and in those early days, um, I don't think I really saw the pain as much in, you know, at least um, the first few years. But I, the one thing I've learned more than any other is that my wife is a warrior. I mean, she really uh, is amazing when it comes to, to oftentimes hiding this pain. As she said, she knows that she, I mean, she's been able to deal with it. Um, there are days, uh, and I know this because I live with her. I mean, she's in pain every day. It's just a matter of some days are better than others. And uh, sometimes, as, sometimes Ken will get out a stickum, you know, those little yellow stickums. Oh yeah, I, one of the things that we do as a couple, uh, some days she just needs a little extra courage. <laughs> so I get one of those little stickums and I, I draw a little C on it and place it over her heart. And, Put it right uh, over my heart and send me off to work. Johnny, this is your courage today. And, and uh, anyway, we get a chuckle out of that. I think uh, probably uh, most people who know you or heard you speak at conferences or <clears throat> who have seen the two of you together uh, had always just assumed that you had an absolutely model marriage. In your book, you reveal that that's not exactly the way it was. What, was, what has been the most difficult for you to deal with? The, the chronic pain, the recent cancer a couple or so years ago, or the celebrity? Well, there was a little of all of those things, Jerry. But I think, you know, as uh, Johnny and I have been married now for a little over 30 years, the first thing that, that really comes to mind is making the adjustment to the 24-7. Um, you know, when we got married, like any couple, we were just very much in love. Love is blind. <laughs> love is blind. And, and uh, yet, you know, I, I was married to a, a woman who really loved the Lord. Um, First Samuel 16, 7 says, you know, that God doesn't look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And I fell in love with Johnny's heart. Yeah, yeah, but my heart. I mean, there, there were many times in the beginning of our marriage, that first five, ten years, oh my goodness, my heart was anything but lovely to look at and to, to um, wow. I, I remember one time Ken was um, sitting on the edge of the bed and he said, I, I just feel so trapped. The 24-7 day-to-day routines, nonstop, always the same. And he said, I'm just worn out, I feel trapped. And my response was, well, what's the matter? Didn't you realize it was going to be like this when we married? Where was your head? Didn't you think? Didn't you know quadriplegia was going to be hard? And as soon as I said those words, I felt awful that I'd said them. And I said, oh, Ken, please, that, that's just not like me. Really, this is not like me at all to be this way. But my quadriplegia and pain have shown me that is like me. That's exactly like me. And, and suffering becomes the lemon that God keeps squeezing to reveal the not so pretty stuff of which we are made so that it can be brought to the light and confessed. Ken, I am sorry, please forgive me. Please forgive me and point it out when I get to be that way again. I don't wanna be that way, so show me where I've gone wrong. That kind of communication is priceless. It's, it's mm -hmm. priceless. And I think that what happened was there had to come a point, and I was feeling a little bit guilty in those early years about not being able to share this with Johnny, that, of feeling trapped. But I, I also said at the same time, Johnny, I still love you, but I feel trapped by this disability. What, was there a tendency toward then depression? Yes. Fighting depression? Yes. yes. 
that was a big thing. Those in were our those marriage. middle years of our marriage. We call them the uh, tired middle years. You know, I was teaching school as a high school teacher and, and uh, going to school, and you know, it was kind of like my respite away from um, from the disability. And uh, you know, we we had a good marriage, but uh, you know, like like a lot of marriages, we. We just had those tired years. We were kind of running parallel tracks. But one thing we did was get people to pray for us. We knew that prayer would help lift the fog of depression. We didn't know the answer. We didn't know the way out. We knew that Jesus was our goal to fix our focus on Him, but how does that play itself out day to day? So we just asked people to be praying for us. Um, we, we confessed our sins one to another. We, we uh, started getting into certain disciplines like reading the Bible together, praying together, and I think it was those disciplines that, that helped lift the depression. And I think in the middle of it, Jesus was the really key for, to keeping us together. Um, both Johnny and I love the Lord, and, and uh, I think in those troublesome times, the difficult times, uh, the fact that we both love Jesus uh, made a difference. And then there came a time some years later when, again, he sat on the edge of the hospital bed and said, I still feel trapped. But this time my response was, I don't blame you. And I'm not going to fault you. I'm not going to scold you. Because I think if I were in your position, I'd feel exactly the same way. So I'm with you in this, Ken. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to scold you. I'm with you. I'm next to you. I'm going to cheer you on through it. We'll get through it. I mean, that, that's the more Christ-like response. Hard lessons learned through, as Johnny says, the lemon squeezed through suffering. More from Ken and Johnny on caring for a chronically ill loved one right after this. She has been such a wonderful partner uh, in terms of our marriage and also my best friend. And, you know, she is a warrior. And home is where we are. Yep, we've learned that. We've learned that. When, when he's off uh, fly fishing, I'm so glad that he's left home, but it's not quite home. And when we're together, when we're traveling overseas, wherever, home travels with us because we're with each other. Welcome back. Today, Johnny Erickson Tata and her husband Ken are discussing the ups and downs of a 30-year marriage where celebrity, travel, quadriplegia, cancer, and especially daily chronic pain are all part of the mix. Here's part two of our discussion. Ken, what would, what would you say to people who are watching the program uh, who are responsible for the care of maybe a child, uh, maybe a spouse, or a father or a mother uh, who's going through pretty much what you are, a feeling absolutely trapped and fighting depression, what would you say to them? There are no simple answers. I know for us that, that because we have Jesus in our lives, that has been a huge part of keeping us together. But on a practical note, you know, as far as caregiving goes, you know, you can't do it on your own. I, I would say that you need to, if you're a, a man, you need to have some brothers alongside you that, that you can go to to share your heart. Uh, oftentimes I can share things with Johnny, and, and I do, but I need somebody else to be able to, to, you know, bounce things off of. And so I have a couple of guys that I know that I can call any time uh, just to say, hey, you know what, I'm feeling a little depressed right now, and I need somebody to, you know, I need someone to talk to. Is that an important part of this? Oh, oh yes. My goodness, yes. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, for those people who have to deal with this on their own, that aren't able to share this with someone else, very tough. And, and you know, I'm married to my best friend, but I think you need somebody apart from your, even our relationship with Johnny and I. Yeah. And uh, you, need, you need time uh, by yourself. Uh, you know, and I think Johnny is, well, she knows I need time to go out and exercise or just be away, you know, from the situation. Fly fish. Fly fish, you know. 
be with other guys. There used mm. to be a time in the early years of our marriage when I was so jealous and envious of these friends of Ken's because I would see him run to his friends and talk to them and get on the phone and he'd be on the phone for an hour and I'd hear him hang up and say, love you, buddy. <laughs> and I'd think, love you, buddy? <laughs> Gee, I don't get that. And now, so many years later, if these friends call and I happen to get on the phone first before they ask for Ken, I'm thanking them. I'm profuse. I am so grateful. Oh, Jan, Pete, God bless you guys. I just love you. Thank you for the, the strength that you are to my husband. Keep it up. Keep it, keep him memorized. Just whatever you're doing, just keep it up. Go fly fishing, uh, j you know, just go, f go uh, uh, hunting birds in the high desert, whatever it takes. Just <laughs> love my husband, because you're doing a good job of it. And that, that's, I think, a great help mm. when a spouse can offer the caregiver that kind of support. You still have to call your buddies? Well, I, I, I still call my buddies, but she has been such a wonderful partner uh, in terms of our marriage and also my best friend. And, you know, she is a warrior. And, and home is where we are. Yep, we've learned that. We've learned that. When, when he's off uh, fly fishing, I'm so glad that he's left home, but it's not quite home. And when we're together, when we're traveling overseas, wherever, home travels with us because we're with each other. Johnny, I, I've heard everything you said, uh, but at the same time, uh, you've had quadriplegia, uh, you've had broken bones, you had a chronic pain. Uh, a couple of years ago, you were diagnosed with breast cancer, had a mastectomy. Has there ever been a time, is there a time, when finally you just said, God, this is enough. No more. Hmm. Why me? Well, there will be more. We know that. I'm in my 60s. It's not going to get easier from here. It's going to get harder. I, I tend to think that when, before I broke my neck, I, I just imagine a Job-like scenario where this, the devil went before God's throne and said, see that girl down there having fun, athletic? You let me break her neck. You let me just trifle with her a bit. I don't think she's going to trust you. And God said, okay, extended Satan's leash. I get a broken neck. And then he comes back and says, well, yeah, okay, so she trusts you. But you know what? You throw chronic pain in there, she'll cave in. And I think God probably nodded, gave permission, let Satan out on his leash and trifled a bit. And, and then I, I, I imagine that the devil probably came back up before God's throne some years ago. And said, okay, okay, so quadriplegia, pain. Okay, so she still trusts you. But you know what? Give her cancer. Give her something that's really life-threatening. Then she'll throw in the towel. Then she'll defame your good name. And God said, I'll let you trifle with her. And I am so, I'm so invigorated, Jerry, with that scenario because I, I am counted privileged enough for God to say, you know what? Cancer, quadriplegia, chronic pain, and whatever else may come down the pike, it gives me a chance to make God's name famous to showcase that His grace really is sufficient, and it's hard, and I will tell people so. I'll explain that I'm not a strong person, that I need Jesus desperately. If I'm, if I'm nasty to my husband, I'll quick confess the sin, not only before him, but before others. Uh, living a life vulnerable and exposed, because I know that, that, that that's when my spirit is most tender, and, and keeping in God's word, keeping praying. I am the most blessed person. I am so blessed to be in this scenario. My eternal estate in heaven has become so much more enlarged through my suffering that I just can't wait to get there. I believe, I will believe I will be one of those who the Apostle Peter says will receive a quote, rich welcome hmm. in heaven. Not just a welcome, but a, a rich welcome. Johnny and Ken have written honestly about their story in Johnny and Ken, An Untold Love Story. And you can get it at johnnyandfriends.org or wherever books are sold.